Hello and welcome to Baiju's Exam Prep IAS. A very very warm good morning to everyone on this lovely Saturday. I hope all of you are doing absolutely fine. It is 10 a.m. once again, meaning that it is time for us once again to analyze the day's Hindu newspaper. As you know, every single day we come here and bring you the most significant, the most important news stories from the Hindu newspaper, which are relevant for different subjects in the UPSC examination, both for prelims and the mains point of view. Let's see what are the articles that we will be discussing today without any further ado. Let's begin with the very first article that we have here for you. The first article that we have here for you that we'll be discussing today focuses on whether the government is actually looking after the welfare of the poor people in the country or not. Now, let's see what is this article all about and what is the author trying to say. This article in fact has multiple authors. In very simple terms, the theme of this article is that if you look at the budget of the government of India, not just the recent budget, if you look at the budgets in the past few years, you will see one very important theme. And the theme is government has been reducing its spending on social security and welfare schemes. Now, what exactly do we mean by social security or welfare schemes? Social security or welfare schemes mainly means those kind of schemes which the government runs for those people who cannot afford to take care of themselves. For example, that can be pension for old age people. That can be pension for let's say widows. That can be let's assume giving education to orphans. These are just some kind of examples of what a social security scheme would be or what a welfare scheme would be. So as per the authors here, if you look at the budget that the government of India has been giving to its social security schemes, that is actually reducing. If you remember a few days back in one of our analysis sessions only, we had discussed how the government of India has reduced its expenditure on Manarega also. This year, the money that is allocated to Manarega is lower as compared to last year. And here author is saying, even for other schemes as well, for food security program, the free food grains that the government of India used to give, even that is coming down. For Manarega, the program, again, the number of, uh, the amount of money that is being given is coming down. Even when you look at fertilizer subsidy, other types of subsidies, as per the authors, that expenditure is also coming down. Now, there are two ways to look at it. One way to look at it is, if you look at the economist, many economists are very happy about this. Because see, India has always been a budget deficit country. Understand this. India has always been a country where our expenditure is more and our income is lesser. Since our expenditure is more, our income is lesser, that means for most of these welfare schemes, India has always had to take loan from our market. So governments usually take loans from the market and then they run these schemes. So many economists are actually happy about this, that it is good that the government is now reducing its expenditure. Also at a time when you see so many political parties just offering things for free. Vote for us, this will be free. Vote for us, that will be free. Everything will be free. So at a time when other political parties are actually increasing their expenditure on freebies, many economists are happy that the central government has reduced its expenditure on social security. The authors, however, do not think from that point of view. The authors here say that in a country such as India, where there is still so much poverty, we need to look into the welfare of the poor sections of the society. The authors here give example of one specific scheme of the government of India. There is a scheme that they have mentioned that is called NSAP. National Social Assistance Program. Now please understand what exactly is this program and what are they trying to say. So this program that is a National Social Assistance Program has been running in India for a very long time. Since 1995, this program has been running. Now, what is this program? Let me tell you. In simple terms, this program is that the government of India gives pension to those people who are below the poverty line. So if you are below the poverty line and then you are certain old age people or you are a widow, 
in that case you will get pension from the government simple i hope you all understand this for below poverty line people government will give them certain pension to those who are old age or widow now what is the problem here the problem here is when i tell you how much pension does it actually have the pension that it actually has is 200 rupees per month for elderly and 300 rupees per month for the widows just imagine the monthly pension is 200 rupees per month and 300 rupees per month that is not a single day that is one month's pension and the problem the biggest problem is since 2007 this number has just not increased since 2007 it is the exact same amount of pension that is given under the scheme now do you can you even imagine government sending you a pension and when you look at your account how much pension do you get 200 rupees in a month recently i'll tell you what something very recently happened so because these people who were getting pension of 200 rupees per month they're very angry they started protesting they started protesting saying that we challenge the members of parliament that they if they think that this is good enough why not let them also survive in this pension because we understand what is 200 rupees per month 200 rupees per month is not even 7 rupees a day do you understand this this is less than rupees 7 in a day that is what this pension is rupees 300 pension is rupees 10 per day that is what the authors are saying that in a era where inflation is rising so much what is it that is at the same cost that was in 2007 and now everything that was let's say for rupees 10 or rupees 20 in 2007 the cost has increased there is nothing that is costing the same amount of money to you today that costed the same in 2007 just imagine that let's say you are fond of having snacks you are fond of having pani puri golgappa whatever you call it just imagine the rate in 2007 and just imagine the rate today maybe you all were too young in 2007 to have that so i'll tell you in 2007 you used to have let's say 10 pani puris or 10 golgappas for rupees 8 or 10 1 rupees p each now in many bigger cities you might get Six pani puri is for twenty rupees. So if you actually compare that, every single thing has become so expensive, and the only thing that has not changed is this pension. So there was this protest that happened recently, and this is why the authors have written this article. The authors have said because the pension is not increasing, the budget for this is almost exactly the same. For example. the budget is still 9000 crore only for many years because the government is not increasing the budget uh, the number of people who will get this pension the government is not increasing how much money will you get so the budget remains the same and as a proportion of the government's total spending this is reducing how has the government identified who will be the below poverty line people who will get this pension they have been identified as per census of 2001 the other problem here is since the government is not conducting an up to date census we don't have updated data about the poor people in india so all those people who were considered as below poverty line in census 2001 only those people still are covered under the scheme and this is the pension that they are getting now this is one side of the story let me tell you one more side of the story the authors here are comparing central government versus the government of rajasthan they are comparing them with the government of rajasthan why because rajasthan government also recently gave its budget so they are saying look at rajasthan rajasthan government is spending so much money on social security Rajasthan government for example recently they said that we are starting a new scheme will will we'll give 125 days of guaranteed work for urban or rural areas see like manrega scheme is only for rural areas that gives 100 days of guaranteed work Rajasthan government is saying we will give you work in urban areas also and guaranteed for 125 days 
they have also increased minimum social security pension to rupees 1000 per month and they will keep on increasing it Rajasthan government is spending more money on pension etc so basically in short what they are saying is that Rajasthan government is doing so good they are spending so much money on social security now again there are two ways to look at it please understand something please understand we when we analyze these articles these are called opinion articles or opinion pages or op-ed as you call them they are called opinion or op-ed articles because they are opinion of the author the author is saying that this is my opinion you do not necessarily have to agree to it maybe you don't agree to it yes the facts will be the same but the interpretation can be something else for example let's say their opinion is that central government reducing social security expenditure is a bad thing for you you might interpret no it is a good thing i agree to that so when you read something in the opinion pages whatever facts they give are absolutely correct for example the government has reduced expenditure on manarega that is absolutely correct it is a fact but how do you interpret it is different the authors here when they write op-ed articles when they write opinion pieces they are giving their opinion that in my opinion this is good this is bad you can have a different opinion like for example i personally would say i don't agree with this opinion so their opinion is that central government is reducing social security expenditure learn from rajasthan rajasthan is increasing social security expenditure that is what their argument is i personally would say i don't agree to this why because if you look at rajasthan and if you look at how much debt they are under if you look at the economic status in rajasthan look at the gdp of the state it doesn't make sense at a time that you are you don't even have money in your state government coffers and you are still increasing social security expenditure so you might agree with it you might not agree with it that is entirely your idea but as per the authors rajasthan government is increasing its expenditure on social security which is good they also say that inflation has been ignored the example that i just gave you since 2007 this pension scheme has remained almost exactly the same if you go back and look at inflation data of india then you will realize if something was or had cost 200 rupees in 2007 the same thing as per inflation would cost 586 rupees in 2023 so just imagine this if someone was able to buy x in rupees 200 in 2007 that same x will now cost 586 rupees in this year this is the amount of inflation that we have seen but the pension has still remained the same the pension is still 200 rupees or 300 rupees only that is what the big concern is the data is outdated we are still relying on numbers of census 2001 the pension amount is very very low the government has not increased this this is what the entire gist of this article is you might agree you might not agree that is entirely up to you now let me give you certain more details about this scheme because this is not one of those schemes that you hear about quite a lot this is not a current affairs thing so we don't read in the current affairs magazines also but since an article has been written on this let me tell you the details of this scheme as i told you this scheme started in 1995 the entire idea was that since the directive principles say the government of india should make endeavors to ensure that those who are poor those people who are from the depressed classes they are held by the government so government is ensuring that its duty given to it under dietary principles is fulfilled so that is why government introduces pension scheme especially for those who are living below poverty line when this started please understand when the scheme started it had three different parts in 1995 it had three different parts first old age pension scheme second was family benefit scheme and third was maternity benefit scheme now there are five parts of this scheme there are five components this is the national old age pension scheme national widow pension scheme national disability pension scheme national family benefit and annapurna under which ration is also given there are five different components of the scheme every component has a different eligibility criteria 
बट एवरी कॉम्पोनेंट ओनली अप्लाइज टू बिलो पॉवर्टी लाइन फैमिली ओनली दो आर लिविंग बिलो पॉवर्टी लाइन आर एलिजिबल टू गेट दीज पेंशन बट देर आर फाइव कॉम्पोनेट ऑफ दिस स्कीम राइट नाउ लेट मी शेयर विद यू एलिजिबिलिटी क्राइटेरिया ऑफ सम ऑफ दम आई एम नॉट डिस्कसिंग एलिजिबिलिटी क्राइटेरिया ऑफ ऑल दीज कॉम्पोनेट बट जस्ट टू गिव यू एन आइडिया फॉर एग्जाम्पल फॉर ओल्ड एज पेंशन स्कीम द एलिजिबिलिटी क्राइटेरिया इज यू शुड बी एटलीस्ट सिक्सटी ईयर्स ऑफ एज पेंशन विल बी टू हंड्रेड रुपीज पर मंथ from 60 to 79 years then after you are 80 years old your pension will increase to 500 rupees per month similarly the national widow pension scheme for that apart from being from below poverty line you should be at least 40 years of age pension will be rupees 300 after you become 80 years old and assuming you are still alive then you will get 500 rupees per month this is the kind of eligibility criteria but this is all only for those who are below poverty line as per the census of the year 2001 now i wanted to share with you a very interesting example of what some other countries actually do to ensure social security let's understand this see why do the governments need to offer social security why is it that the governments need to offer money as if someone becomes old the assumption is let's say someone becomes old they are not able to take care of themselves so for their ration for their daily needs government should give them money so that they can actually lead a good life now what happens is on the alternative there are some other countries that have a very interesting kind of a scheme there is something called time bank scheme this is used in certain countries switzerland for example is famous for this now what is time bank scheme please understand how does it work so basically in western countries especially there is no concept of joint families in india also the joint family concept is declining at a very fast speed <coughs> but in western countries you will never see any joint families so usually what happens in old age couples or people who are alone they live alone they don't live with their family members so what happens is there are a lot of old age people in the western nations who are living alone so let's say they want or they need something they need someone's help why they might need someone to take them to the hospital they might need someone's help because they are not feeling well they want someone to take care of them so what happens here is any one from the entire city can volunteer that okay i don't know this old man but i will go and help this old man how and why does it work let's say i say or i volunteer that i will go to the home of this old man i will take care of him for 5 hours so if i work for 5 hours for him these 5 hours are deposited in the time bank on my name meaning that if i work or if i volunteer to help someone an old age person for 5 hours that is a record that is registered for 5 hours at 5 hours i help someone then what will happen then in the future when i need help when i become old when i am sick i don't have anyone i can call the government and say see my time bank has 5 hours so send someone to help me for 5 hours and the government will send someone for you to help you for 5 hours because you have earned those 5 hours while you were young you were volunteering for someone that is called the time bank scheme this is what a lot of western countries especially switzerland is very famous for so young people can volunteer can help someone for the time period that they help them 5 hours 6 hours 10 hours 1 hour that time will be registered on their name and then in the end if they need someone's help if they need that i also want some help i want someone to help me they can call on the government number and they can say see i have 5 hours of time please send someone for me for 2 hours or 3 hours or 5 hours and the government will send someone so that is how it works in many western nations in india because we have usually have had joint family concept you don't require someone coming in from outside but that is usually how it actually works then we have the second important topic before i do that let me see if there are some important or relevant questions here <clears throat> uh kishan is saying regards to food security maybe because of isolation from peace clause 
India invoked early. No, no, no. Uh, it, there's a slight confusion here. India has not revoked the National Food Security Program. That is still running. We have revoked the COVID-19 program, so that is gone. Uh, secondly, uh, the peace clause is still going on. The peace clause has not been uh, removed anyway. So I don't think there's a direct connection with that. The connection is that, see, even without the peace clause, government was spending money in giving free food grains. And the fact is, in many of the smaller cities, there was so much food grains given free of cost during COVID that many people were actually selling it back. Many people were actually taking free food grains from the government and selling it in the market. That was also happening. So government realizes that we don't need it. So this scheme was later removed. Okay. Um, then I have a question. Okay. Ram is saying, why Manarega allocation is reduced? Has the government taken a stand away from welfare? No, no. We discussed this earlier as well. The government says that we are reducing the Manarega allocation, which is not a bad thing. The government says, see, at the end of the day, if someone is asking for a job under Manarega, that means the person has no other option because Manarega will give you minimum wages for unskilled manual labor. So if someone is asking for a job for Manarega, that means people have no other option. So we ha government says that we are seeing lesser people are asking for a job under Manarega, which is a good thing for the economy. Plus, again, the argument is, if more people come from job, let's say last year also, if Manarega's budget is, let's say, 60,000 crore, and 60,000 crore rupees expire, and then more people ask for jobs, and the government will give them job. The budget can always be revised, but the government says, we are giving jobs to people in other kind of thing, like under Jal Jeevan Mission, Pradhan Bantri, Avas Yojana. So, government is saying, Manarega, but it is reduced, doesn't mean that we are not spending on rural welfare. We are spending through some other schemes. Perfect. Let's move on then. The next important news story that you actually can see from the front page of the Hindu newspaper today is that the Election Commission of India finally has decided on the matter of who will get the original Shiv Sena symbol. Now, as you know, a few months back, there was a split in the Shiv Sena party where there were two factions. One faction led by Ekna Shinde, who is right now the Maharashtra Chief Minister, and another faction led by Uddhav Thakri. Both of these said, we are the real Shiv Sena, we are the real Shiv Sena, so we want to be the one who actually control everything regarding Shiv Sena. We want the party symbol, we want the party sources, etc. Now you have to understand, whenever there is any split in any political party, and there is a long history of such a split, this is not the first time, there is a long history, whenever there is such a split in the political party, the election commission decides who will get the symbol. Now, it is not just about the symbol, understand this. One of the two sides will get the symbol, the official symbol, but apart from that, it is also about money. For example, let's say Shiv Sena got a lot of donations and they still have 100 crore in the bank account because of the donations that they got. Now, who will get to use these donations? That is also a question. Because only that group which is considered as a real Shiv Sena, they will get to use the donations. They will get to use the real party headquarter. So that is why such a decision is important. And the Election Commission of India usually takes this decision. After many, many months, finally the Election Commission of India has decided it will be the Eknath Shinde group that will be called the real Shiv Sena. Uddhav Thakre group will not be called real Shiv Sena as expected. One side liked the argument, one side did not like the argument. Now, the first thing to remember here is, as per the law in India, as per the Representation of People Act 1951, it is the Election Commission of India that adjudicates any election, any dispute of the political party. So if there is a split in the political party, which party will get which symbol they decide. I will give you so many examples. Samajwadi party, for example, in Uttar Pradesh, they got split a few years back. There was a son and a father split. Then CPI has had a long history of splits. The Communist Party of India keeps splitting into new parties. So whenever there is a split that happens, in the Congress also there was a split at the time of Indira Gandhi, when the older leaders did not like her, she went, she went some other way. It is the election commission only that decides. Now how do they decide? Usually they decide by saying or by seeing which side has support of more MPs or more MLAs. That is what is dependent on them. 
so which side usually has more MPs or more MLAs that is how it is actually decided and this is what election commission of India did this time around as well they asked all the MLAs of Shiv Sena which side do you support 76% said we support Egna Shinde side others said that we support the other side same with the members of parliament most of the MPs most of the members of parliament supported the Egna Shinde side and that is how the decision was taken now election commission of India also as you know has to ensure that political parties are registered political parties work as per the law please understand something <clears throat> the political parties themselves also have their own constitution the political parties themselves also have their own constitution in this case election commission has also said that Shiv Sena was not working as per their own constitution meaning that in Shiv Sena when it was the one single party Uddhav Thakre had taken all the powers with himself there was no democratic functioning of the party so the election commission has also criticized the political party which is very odd usually you will not see election commission criticizing a political party for their internal party working yes they have decided they have taken up this decision that it will be the Ignash Shinde group that will get the symbol but usually it is very odd for election commission to actually criticize these kind of inner party democracies because see the fact is out of all the political parties in India there is hardly any party which has real inner party democracy there are so many political parties where family after family after family is the one that gets to that position there are majority of such parties only that if father leaves a post of the head the son will take up that post so inner party democracy has never really been something that is present in India now as I told you there is a long history of election disputes in India that is the parties breaking up and it is the election commission of India that decides everything regarding that so there is a 1968 order which is called the election symbol reservation allotment order of the president under which election commission of India can decide disputes amongst various groups which are claiming that they should have the same name or the same symbol the interesting part is the decision of the election commission is binding on all these groups whatever the election commission actually decides it is binding now let me ask you one question or let me discuss one more thing see in case of Shiv Sena for example it is easy to decide for the election commission how because Shiv Sena has some MPs they have some MLAs so Shiv Sena oh the election commission asks the MPs and MLAs who do you support whichever side was supported by majority that side became the real shifts and that is fine but what about let's say there is a party a party X that has no MPs and has no MLAs then how will the election commission decide or let's take some other example there is a party that has no MPs and only 10 MLAs 5 MLAs support one group other MLA supports the other group then how will the election commission decide this is where it gets interesting so what happens is if there is a political party through which the election commission cannot decide by their MPs or MLAs elected members then what does it actually have then the party's constitution becomes very important why because in the party's constitution they will specify who will be the head of the party who is the second position in the party who is the third position in the party because in that case the office bearers of the party office bearers means officials in the party they will be the one who will then be asked by the election commission which side do you support and then they will take the decision and that is why adhering to the party's constitution is so important as per the election commission of India let me repeat what I said if the parties don't have MPs or MLAs and there's a split in the party then how is it decided in that case the election commission will look into the party officials officials as per the constitution of the party they will be asked which side do you support as per their answers it will be decided which side should get the real party symbol which is the real party out of the two as I told you it might also happen that election commission might still not be able to decide 
if election commission is still not able to decide then what happens then the election commission says both the groups should have new symbols the original symbol of the party will not be given to anyone the original symbol actually is frozen in fact in this case also in case of shiv sena for so many months the real original symbol was frozen that it will not be used by anyone the two sides got new symbols but now the election commission has decided so the eknath shinde group can use a original symbol also it might also happen that the new political or the two groups can come back together if the two groups actually come back together they reunite in the future then also the election commission can say okay we are allowing you to use the original symbol so reuniting is also allowed and it might happen it happened in case of samajwadi party also it actually they came back together after two groups were formed and again the symbol was given now <clears throat> the next article that we have again is from indian polity the next article is about the recent session of the parliament where a lot of discussion happened where the opposition members kept on accusing the government that you are not working properly you are supporting the adani group there were a lot of remarks made by rahul gandhi also most of those remarks were expunged they were deleted from the record of the parliament as we had discussed that is why this topic has again become relevant so recently malikarjun kharge that is a congress president made a speech in the parliament where he was referring to the fact that election or that the parliament actually has been controlled by the ruling party so much that it has become almost impossible to criticize the ruling party as per mr kharge he was saying that parliament's responsibility or parliament's entire concept is that the executive should be held accountable executive means the ministers the government they have to be held accountable and at a time in the parliament when you are not allowing questions to be asked when someone asks questions to the government you expunge the speech you say that it will not go in the official record when such a thing happens then the entire purpose of the parliament gets defeated the author or the congress president had said that the government is misusing it we anyways have so little session in the parliament and even when they do have the session anyone who is criticizing the government is not allowed to be spoken he also raised questions from the presiding officer as well because as we had discussed earlier it is a presiding officer it is a lok sabha speaker or the rajya sabha chairperson they have the power to decide which words which speeches will go in the official record and which words will be expunged so as per the congress president they also have not been playing a vital role they have also not been unbiased they have also made sure that any criticism of the government is cut out from the official record and that is how the parliament is not really doing its job properly there is one other thing that we ignore usually what happens is we actually see there is so much criticism of the parliament that parliament is not meeting so many days parliament is not doing this parliament is not doing that that we ignore the fact that if you look at the state legislatures the state legislatures are even worse the state legislatures are even worse if you actually see and i'll show you some examples here if you say that the parliament does not meet for a lot of days they have disruptions state legislatures hardly meet do you know many state legislatures have a session for one day or two day they just call a session that they'll say this is a budget session they make the budget speech and then it is gone the session is over then they call the winter session they pass two bills and then they say the session is over i'll give you an example look at this just look at this and you will understand what am i talking about this is the number of days on an average in a year in one year that the meeting actually happens from 2012 to 2021 look at this average punjab legislature from 2012 to 21 every year on an average how many days did they meet 14.5 can you imagine imagine having a job 
where you are told in the entire year you have to come to the office for 14.5 days not more than that can you imagine such a job getting an amazing salary getting an amazing pension also after a turn was over all that you have to do come to the office 14 days in the entire year and almost all states are the same look here Delhi average 16.7 days in a year that is how long their sessions are in the entire year Goa 22 Andhra Pradesh 21 Haryana 14.8 in that comparison Lok Sabha Lok Sabha looks so good see Lok Sabha at least 62.9 in their comparison Lok, Lok Sabha looks so good that oh at least Lok Sabha is meeting for so many days but if you actually see the state legislatures, the state legislatures have hardly been meeting and just imagine if the state legislatures have been elected by the people to make laws, to discuss policies, to take the state forward and they hardly meet, how exactly is it that they will be able to run the country as has been imagined? Again, you can just imagine taking a job which only requires you to go to office 20 days in a year. In a year, just imagine that. People don't even get 20 leaves in a year and they are actually having to go for only 20 days in a year. So yes, in parliament, the number of working days are lesser. But please don't ignore the fact that in the state legislature, it is even lesser. And this is all official data. This is the data from 2021. From 2021 also situation has not improved. Look at Andhra Pradesh. 2021, how many days? Eight days. Look at Delhi. 2021, how many days? Eight days. Tamil Nadu, seven days in one single year. Just imagine that. So this is not really a great sign. Before I move on to the last topic for the day, let me see if I have a few topics, if I have a few comments. I, I saw one comment, I forgot who the name was. There was a comment or someone said that there are hardly any articles in the Hindu newspaper to these days because of a lot of propaganda. It is true. I am not saying it is untrue. Because see, as I told you earlier as well, when you read the opinion pages, the op-ed pages, you have to understand something. These are opinion. They are called opinion for a, for a fact. There is a reason for that. The facts that they are giving you, for example, in the opinion page, if they have a fact, if they say that in the last five years, allocation for this scheme has reduced, that is a true fact. You can't deny that. But their interpretation can be different for you. It can be different for them as well. So you might say it is propaganda, criticism, or it is just uh, a way to come close to the government, either way. But the more important thing for you is to take those facts and then you can interpret it in, in your own way. That doesn't really have to be their interpretation. You can have your own interpretation. You are smart, intelligent people. Use those facts and make sure your interpretation is your original one. Okay. Uh, I'll take one more. Muskan is saying, what is political party's constitution? So Muskan, when a political party is formed, when you register a political party with the election commissioner of India, which is the first step, you have to have a party rule book kind of a thing, which is called the constitution of political parties. So political parties are supposed to have their own constitution, like working of the political party. For example, it will say, the head of the political party will be called the president. We, it, the president will have a tenure of one year or two years, three years or whatever. Elections will happen. Who will vote for elections of our president? How many general secretaries will we have? Who will elect the general secretary? So on and so forth. Who will get what salary, etc. All these things are written in the party's constitution. Perfect. Next article that we have here is about animal trafficking, especially trafficking of pangolins. Because it is the world pangolin day. Now, World Pangolin Day is on 18th of February. This is one of those animals which are highly, highly, highly in demand in the illegal market. They are trafficked all across the world because of certain facts and because of certain misconceptions. Certain facts because <coughs> a lot of people in countries such as China eat their meat and they think that the meat is very delicious. Then there are certain some misconceptions also. Certain people believe that eating meat of pangolins can give them extraordinary powers. It can have a very beneficial impact on their health. There are certain beliefs that people have because of which pangolins are illegally trafficked and traded in large, large, large numbers. In fact, there is a recent report that has come out according to which 
over 1200 pangolins were illegally traded in India from 2018 to 2022. Most of these cases of trafficking of pangolins in India were in Odisha followed by Maharashtra. As I told you mostly it is because China has been or has had a market where a lot of people consume pangolin meat. <coughs> so basically what happens is when people become very rich at the end of the day when you become so rich that almost everything that you need you can buy anyways and even when you keep on having more money then you think of things that others can't do and only you want to do this is when people start developing very weird food habits because someone would have told them if you eat this animal you don't know what will happen to your body you will live for 500 years I'm not saying pangolin will do such a thing but you will see there's a very uh, dangerous trend that has emerged in China and many Southeast Asian countries where a lot of exotic animals are being eaten. There are a lot of exotic animals that are being eaten including pangolins and many others. Now the reason is that it is believed that some of them may be aphrodisiacs only. You can google the meaning of aphrodisiac you will get to know. So many people believe that there are aphrodisiacs. Many people believe that your life will increase. Many people believe that there will be glow in your face or whatever. So there are a lot of different types of reasons due to which they are consumed. In fact when COVID-19 began there was a theory that because many people in Southeast Asia and China have been consuming a lot of these animals which were never a part of our human food chain earlier. That is why all these things are now impacting us in a even worse manner so that is also one of the reasons but anyways for this article mainly the reason for this article being is that the trafficking in pangolins is increasing day by day now although there are laws to protect them but anything that is sold at a higher price doesn't matter what the law is they will always be illegally trafficked See, if there is a price that someone is willing to pay, there will always be people who are willing to break the law for that. So pangolins, because they are sold at a very high price in China and Southeast Asian countries, that is why they are actually trafficked at a very, very high price. As I told you, there are a lot of misconceptions, a lot of concepts related to pangolins. How will they help them? How will they actually increase their life, increase your energy or aphrodisiac levels, etc. But that is why these kind of animals are trafficked. Now in India specifically you will see that pangolins are found in a decent number. There are two species of pangolins that are found in India. The Indian pangolins and the Chinese pangolins. Mainly they are found in Bihar, West Bengal and Assam and there is one more state where they are found that is Odisha. The Indian government has tried to give them as much protection as possible. There are two examples. One, the Wildlife Protection Act. As you know, the Wildlife Protection Act is a law which has different schedules. I am sure all of you have read about this. Wildlife Protection Act had different categories of animals. Schedule 1 means those animals which have been given the most protection. So if you harm Schedule 1 animal, if you illegally smuggle schedule one animal then you would be given the most strictest punishment so pangolins are in schedule one we also see that they are a part of sites sites as you know is a treaty that bans illegal trafficking of animals in sites convention also they are in appendix one so they are given highest protection there as well while indian pangolins are endangered as per iucn Chinese pangolins are critically endangered as per IUCN. Now these pangolins might look dangerous to you when you look at them but they don't harm humans. They are not someone that will kill you so don't worry. They mainly feed on insects and they are then uh, killed by other larger animals as well. So they don't harm humans etc. So there is no problem with that. But the problem here is that they are trafficked in very 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 large numbers because of an increasing demand that we are seeing in countries nearby India. Now there is one example that I wanted to give you of something that was recently in the news. Not very recent, December 2021. So there was a news in December 2021 that Odisha, there was in fact a specific place in Odisha that is trying to increase the population of Indian pangolins by reintroducing them over here. Can you give me or if you have any idea, can you take a random guess 
where exactly in Odisha did this happen? Any random guess? Where exactly in Odisha were they reintroduced the Indian pangolins? Please don't Google it. Without Googling, can you tell me? Where in Odisha, any wildlife sanctuary, any zoological park, any specific place, any city or whatever. I have one guess from Ashish. Okay. No, not Bhavreshwar, not, not, not Chandipur. Okay, let me tell you. So they were introduced in Nandan Kanan Zoological Park. Nandan Kanan Zoological Park. So it is very close to Bhavneshwar. Many people would have gone there. I have gone there. If you actually go there, you will see it's a pretty big zoological park. You will find a lot of different types of species there. 15 kilometers from Bhavneshwar. Now, this is where the Indian pangolins that were rescued from illegal traffickers, they were uh, released here, hoping that their population would increase. They were this was done as a part of WAZA. WAZA is an organization called World Association of Zoos and Aquariums. This is the zoological park where the Indian pangolins were released. This zoological park also has the world's first captive crocodile breeding center. Gharials have been bred there. There is Indian pangolin, white tiger, all of these you will find here. Pretty significant fact for prelims point of view so do remember the name do remember where is it exactly why is it famous for that may be pretty helpful for you going forward now apart from indian pangolins the government of india has realized that there are many other species of animals that might be in danger so there are many other operations that are being run in india by the government to safeguard certain species please do remember this slide for the prelims examination there are certain names of operation that I'll share with you. There's something called Operation Save Kurma that is for stopping illegal trade of live turtles and tortoise. Then similarly there's Operation Turt Shield, Operation Clean Art that is specially for mongoose here. Operation Soft Gold. Soft Gold is to tackle the Shaitu Shawl illegal trade that again is very very prevalent in India. We also have Operation Free Fly and Operation Wet Mark. These are just a few examples of a lot of other kind of schemes the government is running to ensure that illegal trafficking and trade in these animals actually stops. This brings me to the end of today's discussion on the Hindu newspaper's important articles. There are a couple of practice questions for you on the screen. As always, please make sure you go through them. Please make sure you try and write answers to them. First, while parliament's attendance remains dismal in India, the state legislatures with an even worse record are overlooked. Suggest measures to overcome this issue. Second, what are the challenges faced by the government in curtailing illegal human trafficking in India? This brings you to the end of the session. Thank you so much for joining in. I'll see you tomorrow. Sharp 10 a.m. once again for the Hindu News analysis tomorrow. Make sure as soon as you end this, move over to a Telegram channel. Do attend the quiz based on these articles. Thank you so much for joining. Have a good day. Jai Hind.